Guten Nachmittag. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to today's virtual talk, Organized Kindness and Organized Gratitude, a Minnesota tradition with our friend Mark Ritchie. Um, I'm Gina Anderson, Executive Director of the Germanic American Institute, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, some quick technical notes before we begin. Um, this is our first uh, live um, program, and so we think we have got a really great, all the kinks worked out, but we're going to keep our microphones muted during Mark's presentation. You can adjust your view settings to your comfort. Many of you are Zoom pros, we know after seven months of virtual gatherings, but please use the chat function to message the GAI host for assistance with any technical issues or questions. Um, after Mark's presentation, we'll have time for some Q&A, and you can just submit your questions via the chat function. So thank you again for joining us. Um, I am just so happy to introduce our speaker. He's a longtime friend of the GAI, Mark Ritchie. Many of you know Mark from the great work he does leading Global Minnesota. Mark is well known here in Minnesota and around the world for being an effective, a cross-sector leader. His experience spans government, nonprofit, education, and advocacy organizations. Um, prior to his work at Global Minnesota, Mark was the head of Minnesota USA Expo, uh, leading the public-private partnership to host the 2023 World Fair Expo in Minnesota and he served as Minnesota Secretary of State from 2007 to, 2002, 20, to 2015. And we are delighted to have a leader and a historian of Mark's caliber to join us here today. Um, Mark's presentation is part of the GAI's Transatlantic, Transatlantic Chapter series on pivotal moments in German and American relations. Uh, this series includes the exhibit, which is at the house, uh, Stars and Stripes Over the Rhine, the American Occupation in Germany after World War I. And there'll be other expert speakers um, throughout <clears throat> this exhibition. So please just visit our website, gai-mn.org backslash chapters for more information and registration details. And now I will turn the microphone over to Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much, Gina. And thank you for inviting me and for creating this series about this very important topic at this moment in history. What are those key elements of when our relationships across the transatlantic divide and now the transatlantic corridor, um, some important moments. And I have the uh, thrill on Sunday to come and see this uh, exhibit in full, full life. I've heard about it for a couple of years and now uh, I wanna just thank you for bringing that into our community. I, first heard about this exhibit about the U.S. Army occupation in Germany. Uh, to, I accidentally bumped into somebody in an exhibit in Washington, D.C. It was about something completely different. And uh, we got to talking and he asked me where I was from. I said, Minnesota. He said, oh, do you know Brown County? I said, well, yes, you know, I'm Secretary of State. I campaigned there all the time. He said, oh, I, I'm working with the Brown County Historical Society. We have this exhibit. And then he started to tell me. It turned out he was on the World War I National Committee, representative of the American Legion. And this uh, piqued my curiosity for many different reasons, but one of them is like, wait a minute here. How come I've never heard about this? Wait a minute here. My family name is actually Richter, but my grandfather's boss didn't want any German, so he just picked another name for us. And so how come I never heard about this? And so in my curiosity, I began to look and find and try to understand further what were these connections and what were the relationships. And the thing that was uh, striking for me, and I hope that all of you will have a chance to come and really see this amazing exhibit up close, um, was the element of discussion about the way that um, the soldiers and the local community there began to interact, lots of rules, lots of things. but in that process and began to build the kind of personal relationships and then the kind of caring relationships that you'll be uh, hopefully soon able to read about. Um, Major General Henry Allen, who was a uh, commander uh, for part of the time of the occupation, he began creating soup kitchens and other ways because he could see that everybody was starving. I mean, this was Europe wide, but he um, not only took those actions while he was uh, in the commanding officer position, but then after he returned home to the United States, raising millions of dollars to send food aid and financial assistance. And that assistance went on for years in his name and in his memory. 
And it was an element of organized kindness. And I've come to see how deeply embedded in the values of Minnesotans and in our way of living and our way of being, uh, organized kindness is uh, a critical part of who we are as a people, both as a state, but I would argue as a nation. And I've been thinking a lot about that subject. And so when asked how would I like to frame my comments today, I picked that title, uh, Organized Kindness and Organized Gratitude. And I do believe it's a deep Minnesota history and Minnesota heritage and part of who we are. But in the nation and in North America, the notion of being welcoming, being generous, being kind and being organized in kindness goes back long time before you know, what we think of as the sort of founding of the nation. I mean, native indigenous people came here tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, so over a thousand years ago, indigenous people helped uh, Nordic people who landed on our Eastern coast to be able to survive winters and to uh, be here for a while. But we really started our uh, kind of uh, sort of official kind of call it governmental uh, assistance and uh, taking care of people in other places. Um, in 1812, there was a earthquake in Caracas. Uh, it, there was communication about this to uh, Washington, to Baltimore. Uh, people became aware of the devastation. Uh, there was a proposal made by a congressman from North Carolina, just out of the humanitarian impulse, hearing about this. And um, the US Congress authorized $50,000, but they also had to tiptoe around some political issues because there was an embargo on sending things to Venezuela because it was revolution. And so um, that, at that moment, there was a humanitarian impulse. Our federal government acted. They had to deal with some of the politics of this, which remains with us today in a certain way. Uh, but it was a good, uh, good example of kind of how, as a people, we were still thinking about others in other places. And I, I, um, I'm, sometime in my life, I'd like to know more about all of that. But that was in 1812. Over the next 100 years, leading up to that First World War period, where this exhibit is really about that in the post-First World War period, um, much of what we would think of as humanitarian assistance, uh, organized kindness, um, was done through uh, citizen and civic institutions of different kind. Uh, the, the churches, the organizations that uh, grew out of diaspora communities, people who had come to North America from other countries. Uh, sometimes it was uh, organized and fueled by Americans who were overseas, could see the impact of a earthquake or some disaster of some kind or a conflict. Uh, and they were able to mobilize resources back in the United States and in North America uh, to help make a difference. There were some very unusual situations. Some of you recently might have caught the news of the Irish uh, responding to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic devastation inside the Choctaw Nation um, in our own country. And it was uh, a remembrance of the fact that the Choctaw Nation uh, I think it was in 1847, sent over money to help people in Ireland who were facing uh, one of their worst famines ever. And so there were interactions between our government, the tribal governments within the United States and within the organizations of, of the community, the broader civic society. Uh, but it wasn't really until um, the First World War that this began to be really changed and different in a way that uh, General Allen was able to think about in reference when he was trying to help the people, especially the mothers and children of the, of the Rhine region in Germany. I mentioned that one of the ways that this was organized was Americans would find themselves overseas and hear about a situation. Um, and this actually was one of the uh, critical elements in a key way that Minnesotans became much more involved and directly uh, active in organized kindness towards uh, Europe. And that was that uh, an American engineer, a relatively young man, 40 years old, uh, found himself in London. He was a mining engineer, but also was a consultant to mining companies around the planet. He was there um, 
recruiting exhibits for what was going to be a giant World's Fair in San Francisco, uh, talking to different nations and different companies. And he um, was in the right place, so to speak, when um, about 100,000 Americans fled out of Belgium uh, right in the beginning of the First World War. And many came through London, many didn't have any money, didn't have resources. And uh, Herbert Hoover was sort of a genius logistics person. He was one of the uh, kind of premier people around logistics. And so uh, this future president of the United States, young mining engineer, Herbert Hoover, uh, organized the repatriation and return to the United States of about 100,000 people. And it took a lot of different things to make that happen, but it impressed the American uh, embassy and the ambassador of the United States in London he spoke to the ambassador of Belgium who had been uh, trying to figure out uh, what he could do because they were facing a desperate situation in Belgium and Northern France at this time. Uh, the British had blockaded all the ports and were not allowing any food in. Uh, the soldiers and the armies that were occupying the region were taking food and taking it back to Germany and various things were happening. A lot of the young farmers were gone and there was so much disruption that the country of Belgium was within a month of being completely out of food. This is a bit unprecedented. Of course, uh, sieges are a very old military tactic, uh, but the notion of an entire nation, somewhere between nine and 11 million people, including a couple million in France, uh, were essentially run completely out of food was what was facing the Belgian people. And so uh, they went and they asked our future president, Herbert Hoover, if he would take on the job as a private citizen to raise the money, find the food, find the transport and get it to Belgium uh, to help keep somewhere around 10 million people alive. And um, Herbert Hoover was a Quaker. And he also had been orphaned as a boy. He had a lot of deep values about the human condition and humanity and his uh, obligations and his uh, necessity to be of service. And he didn't hesitate. He said yes. He set aside his career, his company, the, the things that he did. And he began the process of creating the Commission for the Relief in Belgium. And um, in doing so, he was starting out, although he didn't know it at the time, uh, on a 10-year uh, journey where between 2014 and 2023, he headed up in Europe, uh, the, what was at that time the largest humanitarian effort ever, ever undertaken, feeding about 100 million people or more, some say 170 million people, in 45 countries, um, including uh, a period of time in Russia and the Ukraine in the, in the time of 1921, 22, and 23, uh, probably the worst drought ever experienced there, but certainly the worst human catastrophe of famine uh, we had known in history. And he tackled that in combination with uh, Fritjof Nansen uh, from Norway. The two of them together fed about 23 million people there, saved their lives, literally saved their lives, and Nansen um, was recognized with a Nobel Peace Prize for that. But in that work, he found a partner in the United States to help him find and identify where to get this food, or most of it being flour, wheat flour. Bread is staple everywhere. And uh, in that process, he came to uh, call on another Quaker another person very value driven, very value led, James Ford Bell. James Ford Bell was a um, Minnesotan who was at that time the president of the Washburn Crosby Milling Company, Washburn Crosby Company. Uh, sometimes nowadays we'll, we'll see WCCO on our radio or television, that was Washburn Crosby. Uh, they did a number of different things, but they were primarily the leading with a group of other leading flour milling companies uh, with the Pillsbury's um, and other grain handling companies like Cargill. And from 1884 to 1930, our cluster of flour milling companies dominated the entire world market in flour. 
and the Washburn Crosby Company had the world's largest flour mill. They called it their A mill, but we think of it today as the Mill City Museum. Many of us are familiar with that. And um, James Ford Bell was the head of that company, and he also was um, a very, very respected leader in that uh, industry. And so Herbert Hoover asked him to join him as a volunteer, calling on his values again, and uh, if he would be the liaison to the flour mills and the milling industry throughout the country. And so he took on that task and together um, the two of them figured out how to make it possible to find the food, to get it delivered and shipped, put it on both, and Herbert Hoover figured out how to convince the German high command in the army and the British Navy, the British government, uh, to allow this food to come through the blockade and to be able to, to feed um, the Belgium and French people. And the thing about the whole experience was that it was the first time that there was a kind of recognition that the new era of industrialized warfare, mechanized and industrialized warfare, had really created a, a new set of conditions that civilians and others would face. And um, we had experiences with how we organized our kindness in the past, uh, but it was generally at a much smaller scale. I mean, we have some incredible examples in Minnesota. Some of you know the story of how the Mayo Clinic came to be, but there was a tornado. Many, many people hurt, many killed. Um, the nuns there in Rochester uh, opened up their, uh, all of their facilities. They were used as kind of a makeshift hospital. Uh, Dr. Mayo, who was there in Rochester, is um, part of a you know uh, recruitment effort of the Union Army. He was the physician taking care that our new recruits were healthy. Um, the nun said to Dr. Mayo, after look, we can't have makeshift. We have to be organized in how we approach this. Uh, we, the nuns, will build a hospital. We will staff it as the nurses. You and when your sons are old enough to join you, will be the doctors. They were a little reluctant at first, but pretty soon they got on board and Mayo Clinic came because they knew they had to be organized. Some of you know um, Sanford Health. It's, uh, uh, it's an organization, um, one of the, the larger and most important of our nation's um, healthcare institutions. And when they were just getting started, they used the title, an institution of organized kindness. So this idea that caring for others and being generous for others was important, but it also was had to be organized. And this is what began to distinguish uh, what Herbert Hoover and James Ford Bell and others were doing uh, in Europe. So when the U.S. forces um, moved into the Rhine region, uh, what they found was unbelievable impoverishment and starvation. And in that context, this was Europe-wide. Um, American generals who were, uh, you know, part of the leadership would comment just on how, uh, how terrible conditions were everywhere. And so, um, you know, in that instance, and this is very well described in the exhibit, the stars and stripes over the Rhine, uh, began setting up uh, organizations like soup kitchens and began making appeals for um, financial support. And they began to, um, you know, begin to see in an organized way that they had to find the human connection. They had to find the ways of providing for people in an organized way. And this was, um, you know, a kind of a critical element to thinking about how the world could knit itself back together again after that terrible war. But in this process, I began to ask myself, look, you trained to be a high school history teacher. I'm certified or was many, many years ago to be a high school history teacher. How come I didn't know any of this history? And uh, my father was a World War II veteran. Uh, we talked about the Second World War a lot. How come I never heard this history, although he served in the Pacific. Um, but two things happened to me that got me thinking more about this. I uh, once kind of randomly stopped at the Hoover Presidential Library, which is in Iowa, West Branch, Iowa. Didn't know much about Herbert Hoover, except the sort of, you know, 
bad mouthing that goes on about the depression, but there on the on the grounds were these incredible statues, uh, beautiful statues of mothers and lots of children, and they were these plaques that said, to President Herbert Hoover from the mothers and children of Belgium, thank you for saving our lives. And there were lots of these, and there were letters and other things around. I well, hmm, what's that about? What what is that? And so. A little bit later, I began to uh, study this a little more. And at a meeting in Minneapolis, when we used to be able to meet, I met a representative of the Belgium government. It's actually the regional government of Wallonia and Brussels, who's uh, responsible for trade and investment things. And somehow the conversation came around to history and he asked me if I had and knew anything about the letters from the children of Belgium to the children of America, thanking them for saving their lives. And I said, well, I'd seen something about this. And he said, well, we, you know, we have a whole display about this of letters that had been found, that had been lost and had been found. And so piqued my interest. And in doing so, I began to study a little further what was the impetus, what was the story. And it turned out that um, in the kind of middle of the occupation of Belgium, uh, when the food had begun to arrive, a group of school children, mostly girls, a group of school children, um, wrote these beautiful letters, beautifully hand uh, written and, and designed and painted, it's amazing. They had brought them to the US Consul General in Liège. He was sort of the highest ranking American that was there. And they, they asked that these be delivered to the people of America, the children and that. And um, he had uh, saved them carefully. He then died right before the U.S. got into the war, because in this time period, the U.S. was not in the war yet, still neutral. But in any case, um, these were sort of lost to history. And really about 100 years later, his great-granddaughter, uh, was with her father and they were going through a trunk in the family attic and then the bottom of a bunch of lace and gloves and things there was a beautiful little wrap package and they opened up and these unbelievable letters were there and she took them to the Belgium embassy the consul general there one of his staffs understood that this was you know an, an expression from children to children that was incredibly powerful and they, they, they took the effort to then to turn this into a display. And that display has become an exhibit. And now um, we're actually hosting that Global Minnesota with the Mall of America and a group of other organizations. So it's out at the Mall of America where people can see it. Our first goal was to put it down at the Mill City Museum who really created much of the wheat flour that went to Belgium. But anyhow, they're closed for the pandemic period. But what you see in that is the power of organized gratitude in being able to convey the humanity of connectivity. And I think that comes through also in the exhibit about stars and stripes. The touching and, and understanding of this uh, really made a difference. And in that time period, that first World War time period that we're talking about, uh, some of the um, horror of that war and you know we had language the war to end all wars or the great war but just the horror of that war uh, reflected in poetry like Flanders Fields and then you know recreated in movies and such it was something that pushed people to really say we have to start we have to find a different way and you had Minnesotans like Frank Kellogg uh, who in his role as Secretary of State with the French Foreign Minister Briand, created the Briand Kellogg Treaty, which was signed on by people, uh, which basically uh, banned, made illegal in international law, wars of aggression, and it was used to prosecute the Nazis. So it was a very powerful, powerful tool. President Wilson pushed to get the first international organization of the League of Nations, which eventually transformed itself, it became the United Nations. Um, Herbert Hoover uh, ran this program to feed Europe for almost a decade, but he took his own money and he created a library 
of all the materials that could tell, in, tell the world something about how did we get into this, second, this world war and what can we do to never have another one? And that's what we call today the you know, Stanford uh, Hoover Institute is that library to try to find a way to not have another war. And a number of our most important leaders of the 20th century who were part of General Pershing's staff and were deeply involved in the occupation uh, and in the post-war period, uh, George Marshall, who saw the devastation and understood the importance of rebuilding the economy and it drove and informed him in his thoughts about the Marshall Plan and about that whole reconstruction project. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was another young leader in the general staff of Pershing and it deeply impacted him and his understanding of war and um, the devastation of war and also his understanding of uh, what needed to be done, what needed to be done after a war to knit humanity back together. I, I wanna talk a little more about Eisenhower because today's his birthday. He would have been 130. Now, according to Time Magazine, some of us living today will live to be 130, not me, but some. But anyhow, Eisenhower in a way is still um, with us and all the different things that he contributed and made in our society. And like General Allen, he thought a lot about what else he could do to help change the situation of the people, uh, of the place. Uh, and. Um, Eisenhower in, was in particular really well aware of how the outcome of the Second World War that now he had seen two world wars plus the depression, um, the, the depravity and just the uh, situation uh, of how it was affecting especially the children and how that was going to influence the future. And he began to uh, agitate about this and to speak out about it. And I have a little uh, tiny uh, a clip of a speech that he gave about uh, what can be done about child hunger in Europe in July of 1948. And uh, I want, I'd like to ask our technical assistant to bring up that first uh, video. Um, he, it's, it's just a few words, but it'll give you a sense of what he understood. The children of today are having, are forming each day the mental concepts, the mental prejudices, the emotions that are going to rule and govern them uh, through their lifetime. And over at least half of the earth, they are hungry. In many instances, in many countries, almost universally, they are going in packs, up and down alleys. They are searching for a garbage heap in which they find all too little of any kind of sustenance, sustenance that will keep them alive. Every man here who served with me in Europe has witnessed this with his own eyes. How can we expect children who are reduced almost to an animal like a level of existence, struggling each day for any kind of scrap that will keep them alive? How can we expect them to develop the ideas and the ideals that in the future will bring them to be apostles of peace? They are by very nature of the struggle they are carrying on, by the very nature of the struggle they are carrying on, wedded to the philosophy of force. Whatever they get, they get by their own efforts and by scratching in the garbage heap. That cannot go on if we are to have peace. President Eisenhower, and not quite president at that time, but he understood these deep things. He understood that everybody who served with him in Europe saw this. He understood that half of the world was in this kind of desperate place. He understood that the situation was forming those children for who they would be in the future, and he was aware that their crisis and their desperation was making them see that force and on your own was solution. And then how can they go to be the apostles of peace? And he was really fundamentally clear that we could not have another world war, that the world, world could not take that kind of 
destruction again, they understood about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the size and scope of industrialized modern warfare. And so in a speech in 1948, he was actually raising money for a uh, relief fund the, that the United States had created. He, um, you know, kind of previewed what his thinking was and what his thoughts were. And so when he got into the White House, uh, he was a kind of a get her done kind of Midwesterner, just like James Ford Bell and Hoover and, and Truman. And so he, um, he created something uh, almost right away, which he called the, the uh, uh, Red Reindeer, Operation Reindeer. So it was around the idea of Christmas, but it was food deliveries uh, to uh, European countries and countries of the former Soviet Union. Um, it was a very big operation and very inspiring, and it led to his creation of what we called a Food for Peace program. Um, that was the, the, the fundamental plan when he went in front of the United Nations in 1960 at the General Assembly and basically laid out the idea that the United Nations should take on the, the role, the responsibility of kind of being the world's 911, that when there was a crisis of food or some other uh, serious disaster, and that could be a war, conflict, civil war, it could be a hurricane or a huge explosion or you know anything, that there needed to be an organized global way to respond at the scale that Herbert Hoover was able to mobilize um, for Europe. And he, um, he made this impassioned plea and it moved the other nations. And he was followed by JFK, next president, who then took this idea and really supercharged it. And then our own uh, Midwestern Senator, George McGovern, uh, got it completely uh, done and became the first person to really move out what we call today the World Food Program. And so that World Food Program was, uh, you know, started out of that learning, that experience of the First World War and the Second World War, with the belief that we had to tackle it, that we had to do something because we could not have another war. Eisenhower created a, other institutions. Some of you know this, but he was the, the sort of impetus behind what we call uh, uh, sister cities. He is uh, organization people to people goes on today as one of the largest uh, connecting points and his uh, granddaughters uh, runs that organization. Um, this, this week, the World Food Program uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize and the Nobel Committee was very clear in articulating their understanding of the real links between peace and food security, between war and hunger. In fact, this was the fourth time that there's been a Nobel Prize directly focused on uh, peace. I, I mentioned that Fritjof Nansen in 1922, in the middle of his partnership with Herbert Hoover, uh, feeding uh, tens of million in Russia and Ukraine in that region, um, was uh, honored for his lifelong humanitarian work, in, including that. Uh, in 1949, um, uh, the, the head of the new organization that was built to create um, uh, food security worldwide, uh, 1945, right after the creation of the UN, the UN created a group of specialized agencies to tackle the underlying causes of war. The first one was the Food and Agriculture Organization and its director and the FAO got the Peace Prize in 49 for tackling hunger all over the world. Um, and then in 1970, Norman Borlaug, uh, an Iowan who was connected directly with the University of Minnesota and kind of a citizen of the world, um, was awarded the Peace Prize uh, for his work in agriculture and plant breeding. And in this year, it was the World Food Program. And so um, we were uh, fortunate in a way we invited uh, many, many months ago, the head of the World Fo Food Program to be our keynote speaker for the upcoming World Food Day conference coming up on Friday, uh, October 16th. Every year on the day that the World uh, Food and Agriculture Organization was founded, so that's October 16th every year, we internationally recognize that day as World Food Day. And often we gather and we try to look at uh, our efforts to combat hunger, uh, and to create a more sustainable, resilient future. And so um, 
Honorable David Beasley, who's a former governor of South Carolina, who's the head of the World Food Program, uh, will be doing our opening address at 9 a.m. Uh, Central U.S. time. And, um, and I've had a little opportunity to talk to him this week because it was really a surprise and caught everybody uh, uh, attention. But it was a recognition by the Nobel Committee that uh, what the World Program does is not only address hunger, and they feed between 100 and I think now it's up to 120 million people. So that's people in refugee camps and displaced people of all kinds and people in Beirut, Lebanon, where there was an explosion that destroyed 85% of the nation's food supply. So they have built systems like Herbert Hoover built system to get food and other necessities in partnership with the World Health Organization that's included the personal protective equipment that all of us have needed and that the healthcare needed has needed greatly during this COVID crisis and uh, ventilators and all that. But they've built a global system. And, um, and in addition to that, the Nobel Committee recognized the World Food Program for its advocacy of peace and its refusal to allow food to become part of the weaponization of conflicts, of violent conflicts. And so their role in peacekeeping and peacemaking has been clear and the Nobel Committee has recognized that it, uh, in a very important way. And keeping that understanding of the inseparability of food and hunger, food security, food safety, all of that to the other basic needs and to the spiritual and social needs of people is very, very crucial. My father was uh, what they call a China Marine. He was a Marine in the Marine Corps and the uh, Marine Air Corps in China, the end and after the Second World War. And he came home um, with a lot of little black and white photos, little square photos of basically people dying in front of his eyes of hunger. And he came home basically saying, I'm going to use a GI Bill and go to school and figure out how I can do something about hunger. And he gave his whole life to that work as a scientist. And so seeing that, like General Eisenhower described, and, you know, like General Allen saw, and like Herbert Hoover saw, has, can really change and really make a fundamental difference in your life. And then one of the reasons I know I'm interested in food and agriculture issues and have been basically my whole life. And so I see that this can be generational and this can be societal if we find ways to organize our kindness and to organize our gratitude. My wife's father was there at D-Day on uh, in uh, June in 1945. And um, this, uh, you know, experience, I mean, 1944, and this experience, um, you know, gave him a different kind of perspective on the world and on where things needed to go. And so when we were living, my family and I living in Brussels, um, when I was working on trade negotiations, we spent quite a bit of time at the beaches of Normandy, just trying to understand more what was going on, what was in people's heads, what was in their hearts, um, what was in their minds. Um, and, and all of that was, uh, you know, something that I've thought about, um, in, you know, in many different ways in my life. But um, I was, uh, for a while, I, I attended um, part of the U.S. Army War College, and part of that is a trip that's sort of next door over to Gettysburg, right, right there in the, in the bay, same area. And at the farm of General Eisenhower, there was a little um, kind of shop that had different kind of items about Eisenhower. And one was a little movie that was a Walter Cronkite obituary that he put together on the day that General Eisenhower died. He took, I think, 25 interviews and clipped them and put them together. And it was, um, you know, showing on one of these loops. And in that movie, in that collection of interviews, Walter Cronkite captured on film General Eisenhower's views about what did he take from D-Day, what did he learn from D-Day, and what does that make him think about in terms of the future? This was on the 20th anniversary of D-Day. And I want to 
close by just sharing just a, a small little clip of what uh, General Eisenhower said back to Walter Cronkite, who asked him, well, what are you thinking on this very special day, the 20th anniversary of D-Day? Walter, this D-Day has a very special meaning for me. And I'm not referring merely to the anxieties of the day, the anxieties that were a, a natural part of uh, sending in an invasion where you knew that many hundreds of boys were going to give their lives or be maimed forever. But uh, my mind goes back so often to this fact. On D-Day, my own son graduated from West Point. And uh, after his training uh, with his division, he came over with the 71st Division. But that was some time after this event. But on the very day he was graduating, these men came here, British and our other allies, Americans, to storm these beaches for one purpose only, not to gain anything for ourselves, not to fulfill any ambitions that America had for conquest, but just to, pre to preserve freedom, systems of self-government in the world. Many thousands of men have uh, died for ideals such as these. And here again, in the 20th century, for the second time, Americans, along with the rest of the free world, but Americans had to come across the ocean to defend those same values. Now, my own son has been very fortunate. He has had a a very full life since then. He is a father of four lovely children that are very precious to my wife and me. But these young boys, so many of them, over whose graves we have been treading, looking at, wondering and contemplating about their sacrifices, they were cut off in their prime. They, are, they have families that grieve for them, but they never knew the great experiences of going through life like uh, my son, I can enjoy. I devoutly hope that we will never again have to uh, see such scenes as these. I think and hope, pray, that the humanity will learn more than we had learned up to that time. But these people gave us a chance, and they bought time for us so that we can do better than we have before. So every time I come back to um, these beaches, or when he, any day when I think about that day 20 years ago now, I say once more, we must find some way to work to, to peace and to a, really to gain an eternal peace for this world. So General Eisenhower and all who sacrificed did give us, they bought for us with their lives a second chance. But they didn't just say, good luck. They said, we have got to find another way. And in the building of organized kindness and expressions of gratitude, relationships and fundamental partnering, can arise, some people take big crises and their reaction is sort of negative and turning inward and selfishness or, um, you know, close the borders. But some people, Eisenhower and Marshall and General Allen and so many others, take the crises of life and say, how do we find cooperation? How do we together find the capacity 
to move ahead to prevent another disastrous war as they had experienced two of, but equally important to feed each other, nourishing souls and spirit and our physical well-being. Minnesotans have deep in their roots the experience of being a welcoming people. A few hundred German Jews here welcome thousands of Jewish immigrants who came from Russia to New York and New Yorkers put them on trains out to here in the late 1800s and found in their generosity the ability of one community welcoming another and Minnesota getting its own vision and becoming the kind of welcoming place that we are. I'm proud to be a Minnesotan and be part of this welcoming community. I'm so grateful that we have a Germanic American Institute to be a part of building out the wider community and very happy that this series will look at different important points in the way that we built our transatlantic relationships. I'm very honored to be able to kick off that series with what I understand is the first of the Zoom webinars, I think first of many, if I'm guessing right, uh, for GAI, and I am grateful for this opportunity to share this story and to be able to take and answer any of your questions. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, that was a very powerful uh, and educational presentation. We all appreciate it. Um, I'd like to invite our audience members to submit their questions via written chat. Um, that should be on the right hand of your screen. Uh, if you have any issues with that um, and you can't find it, maybe you could turn on your camera and, and wave your hand and we'll try to find you. Um, do we have any questions off the bat? If not, uh, then you'll have to deal with, my, with me as a first question. <laughs> Um, so, Mark, um, you know, I, I, I really like how you ended uh, your presentation today with, um, you know, the spirit of, of cooperation uh, that we currently need in the world today, you know, facing a lot of problems. Um, I myself moved back to Minnesota about five years ago after having lived abroad and uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering when, when we bring these topics uh, back into the present, um, what is the what is the sort of current role of Minnesotans today um, in organized kindness, organized gratitude, um, but also sort of dealing with these large global issues? Um, I imagine at Global Minnesota, um, you have your sort of hand on the, the pulse of what's going on today. Um, but if you could sort of give us an idea of, um, of what this looks like today. Um, yeah, I well, I, um, maybe I'll, I'll do three that I think are a little unusual maybe that maybe aren't, aren't always so easy to see, but, uh, but I also, you know, I wanna go back and, and, and affirm some of the things that have been uh, going on for a while. But one of them is that um, Minnesotan companies, all sizes and shapes, all corners of the state, all different kind, have really begun, I would say, affirmatively and publicly uh, showing their commitment to long-term sustainability and resilience, many being incredible leaders in the global goals or what we call the sustainable development goals, this little pin I can't, uh, but this international agreement that by 2030, we're gonna reach a number of goals. In fact, in hunger, it's zero hunger by 2030. Our companies, large and small, have really been in the leadership, and that's been especially apparent in some specific areas that have a lot of um, sort of measurement, like climate change, stuff like that. So that's one place where Minnesota companies have been incredibly important in being leaders. And I think that leadership is recognized, and it's one of the reasons we were able to uh, get uh, inter the international heads of the International Labor Organization, the World Food Program, all these different people to agree to come speak at our conferences, Minnesota's leadership role uh, is recognized in that way. A second one, which I think is less known and I think incredibly important now and going forward is that while we are very familiar with the sort of size and shape of diaspora related social organizations, heritage, Germanic American, Norwegian, you know, Norway House, the Swedish Institute, that sort of thing, 
we have a equally robust and now in a way larger, uh, more recent diaspora community from Southeast Asia, from Mexico and Latin America, and from Africa, especially East and West Africa. And so we have very large diaspora communities, 75,000 people roughly in various Somali communities, about that number from Ethiopia, but Liberia, 46,000. Anyhow, these large diaspora communities, like the diaspora communities from the 1800s and the early 1900s, have social organizations and business organizations that are really connecting us. And uh, Global Minnesota has been able to tap that because we've been trying to learn, for example, uh, we're struggling with our discussions around violence in community and police violence. We're struggling around our conversations around institutional racism. And there are lessons from other countries, South Africa being one of them. There are lessons in truth and reconciliation processes. Sierra Leone is, an, is one example. And a lot of countries have done just a better job on dealing with the pandemic all over the planet, there are countries that, you know, did not let this get out of control. And so we're trying to see how our diaspora connections can not only help <clears throat> build business, very important, but can also be one where we're, we're sort of learning from it and, and trying to, you know, make, make that connection. And then the final one, and, and this is one that um, I, I think I won't say we took it for granted, but Global Minnesota was formed 70 years ago to be a welcoming organization of students coming from overseas. It was the Cold War. It was after the Second World War. There was a lot of emphasis on uh, young leaders coming to the United States as students. And some of those students had arrived and had bad experiences, not here necessarily, but other places. And a group of women leaders said, you know, we need these students visiting to have a positive experience. They need to be welcomed when they arrive. They need to be supported. They need to be talked to about winter, et cetera. And so they did that it very successfully. And so that has grown and there's a lot of this discussion. But last year, suddenly at the federal government level, people decided that they were just gonna throw all the international students out of the country and create big walls and just not let them in. It is a kind of a craziness or kind of insanity, but it really is a threat to places like Minnesota, to our colleges, to our high schools, to our universities, to our companies, to our way of life, and also just to who we are as a people. And the amount of response that was mobilized inside of Minnesota with others to fight back about that and to stop some of that, I think rekindled the understanding that you know, we've been kind of going along just assuming that the rest of the nation was kind of on board with welcoming and wanting to be as internationally minded as possible. And there are some people. And it was not only a reminder that we have to fight for global mindedness and inclusion and being welcoming, because that's who we are. But we also have to remember that Charles Lindbergh, one of the most famous Minnesotans in history, led the America First movement in our nation. We were the place where eugenics got some of its largest, biggest names backing that racist, destructive, really dangerous ideology. So having this push from others that say Washington really disrupting our international community and forcing us to fight back successfully, I think has given us a reminder that we can't take things for granted as they are. We need to keep you know, re-energizing and recharging each generation uh, and in each instance. So these are, these are things that we think of in the internationalization part um, that Global Minnesota is in particular trying to work with and to amplify in the broader community. All right, thank you. Yeah, that's such important work, especially today. Um, Mark, we have two uh, questions from our audience, so I'm going to give them both to you uh, at the same time. But if you forget one, <laughs> I'll refresh your memory. Um, so our first question is from uh, Gina. She asks uh, if you could speak to the importance of the German-American partnership uh, in ending world hunger. And Carla asks um, if, you know, historically, she says many of the answers um, were founded in religious organizations. 
And uh, could you speak to the role of how current religious organizations are involved globally in the current solutions? Yeah, so um, let me start with the second one because um, uh, in a kind of international context of food aid, food assistance, uh, in emergency situations and in, let's say, uh, civil unrest, uh, civil war kind of situation, those are really in a, in a way handled both at the level of the World Food Program, but also at the big uh, organizations. In Minnesota, we happen to have what, what we call a light American Refugee Committee, um, uh, you know, Lutheran World Service, Catholic Relief Services, uh, Jewish American Relief, all of these uh, organizations. And then there's been a whole new generation of uh, church-based um, small, medium, and large size uh, relief, and some of them morph into, I would say, more development. Let's say um, building a, a school or building an orphanage. Um, we have uh, Global Volunteers, which was started, I think, 25 or 30 years ago, that uh, kind of leading the way on strategies for reducing stunting in, right now it's Tanzania. But so I think that it's uh, become incredibly important and it's sometimes politicized a little. I mean, I noticed that there was some jostling about sort of the money that was partly for serving the program in Africa that was aimed at keeping HIV AIDS as a pandemic under control. But in my experience, it's the churches that have been able to get their young people to do a service project in Nicaragua or Haiti or Cuba or uh, churches that have support for a missionary. I, I um, you know, grew up in a little tiny town and at my Methodist church every Sunday night in January was Mission Sunday because my father's life was about hunger. He was always part of bringing people in and we would have people come in and talk about kind of hunger from around the world. And so in a little tiny town, because the church was connected in an international network, you could, you could see those experiences. So um, I, just, I just feel like that kind of communication and connection has been important from the beginning. Just like students moving around the world is really important, it's actually being there and knowing. Um, in terms of like the, the connectivity, I mostly have worked with uh, German farm organizations and young farm organizations and have really since, um, you know, way before when I used to work at the uh, Minnesota Department of Agriculture and was responsible for trade policy. That's why I was in Brussels and that's why I, that's where I made my relationships um, with, you know, the German farm organizations, the young farmers but also with uh, the German Protestant and Catholic organizations. And so over the years then I've paid a lot of attention to the ways that there's a more integrated approach. Uh, Germany has a kind of, a, I would say a, a more integrated approach of a society in terms of uh, development assistance, development aid, and also a focus in regions that other people may not be as paying as close of attention to. And so this is a, you know, a kind of a special thing. And I uh, was very, very happy when I was working myself uh, earlier in NGO working on international trade policy that we always had board members from Germany. So I think that having um, as much interaction, but it's been a very big blessing for all of us on the planet to have this one notion, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as 17 specific things that are numeric and we're all working on them and we can talk to each other and we can celebrate each other and it's north, south, east, west. And there is something new in the application of that kind of global um, shared objective that I think is really critical for us to harvest more directly, even in this COVID period, even in this crazy period. And uh, I can see a lot of German leadership has begun to bubble up about that notion. And maybe it's time to really re-energize re the transatlantic partnership. 25 years ago, I was part of a transatlantic partnership on environment. About a year ago this month, the folks that were part of that process got contacted and say, hey, we want to put that back together. Come to DC, let's meet, let's put it back together. And 
So we did. And one of the main organizations that I had worked with 25 years ago, based in Germany, their main global person was living in Minnesota in Egan, because he married a Minnesotan. So in addition to the things that we might think of at putting together and making a difference in the world, people keep falling in love and finding themselves near boundary water canoe areas or whatever. And so as long as people have freedom to travel, to be friends with who they want to be, to love who they want to, to be a business partner with who they want to, to study where they want to, we will continue to deepen our relationship. It's the people who would block us from studying, from loving, from being with whom we want to, that are the danger. And we share that danger with our brothers and sisters in Germany and all over the world. And we need to help each other in tackling the dangers of those who would strangle the freedoms and replace them with the kind of domineering ideology. Eisenhower didn't say it out loud, but two world wars, that's enough, but they didn't just happen. They were ideology and we need to pay attention. We can't let it happen again. Absolutely. And, um... We here at the GAI have our sustainable development goals <laughs> front and center. Uh, in Fabulous. The See, there you go. And they ten, it's a 10 year countdown, 2030. Right. Um, well, I'm going to uh, give a, um, another minute um, if anyone would like to submit uh, another question to our speaker, to Mark. Uh, can I just urge people, if they're interested, the head of the World Food Program, who just got the Nobel Prize, will be kicking off at 9 a.m. Central U.S. time, uh, you know, on uh, YouTube or however all that's done. You can go to the globalminnesota.org website. Uh, also, um, the exhibit is up at the uh, Mall of America, third floor food court, and it's letters from the children of Belgium to the children of America, thanking them for saving their lives. And it's a moving, beautiful display. And there's a video uh, recording on the YouTube channel of Global Minnesota of these amazing speakers who all came together. Um, James Ford Bell, people know that name from the Bell Natural Museum. Um, the Bell Library, but uh, his first really big project was the two Quakers, Hoover and James Ford Bell, um, putting that feeding of Europe together. And uh, his uh, grandson, Ford Bell, was one of the participants um, in that. So anyhow, a uh, lot more to think and do, but uh, this is a big World Food Week, and I'm just glad Minnesota is the center of that for now. Absolutely. Well, if um, everyone, um, if you'd like to turn your camera back on to give Mark a round of applause, um, I'm not you. sure how folks do that on Zoom these days. Thank so you very but much. But thank you so much, Mark, on behalf of all of us here at the GAI. Um, we're applauding. Good luck with your series. And everybody, come see this great exhibit. <laughs> yeah, I, I echo that. Absolutely. It's, uh, we're excited to see that, uh, both here at our house and uh, at the Mall of America and all of your events on Friday. Best of luck and thank you all for joining us today.